this is a rubber meets the road type issue. And unfortunately, you know, one of, one of the privileges of my job is I get to travel the country and, and get to share about these issues in addition to litigate on these issues. And I will tell you, most pastors are not engaged. They just simply aren't engaged. And I understand, you've got lots of things going on in your lives, lots of responsibilities and duties. So I understand all that. But let me tell you, this is an issue, and, and, and we say, it's not if. It's when, and this is a cover. This is a cover of Time Magazine from a few weeks ago, uh, and it, and I know the, it's a little blurry, but it says "Freedom Fight" with the cross in the middle, and of course the symbol, the, the gay lesbian symbol, all around. This is. I mean, you open the Dallas Morning News this morning. This is the issue today. So I commend you all that 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 you're engaged on this topic. You want to learn more because your churches need to be protected. Your people in your churches need to hear about these issues. And I so appreciate what Morgan said. I mean, look, we're gonna talk about the elephant in the room, and the elephant in the room is homosexuality and, and, and the agenda that, that, that this small group is seeking and imposing on the rest of us. That is true, but as a church, we obviously have a responsibility legally, but we have a responsibility as believers. I'm not here today to talk to you about your obligations and, and loving those who are engaged in that sinful conduct, just like they're engaged, there are those engaged in lots of different sinful conduct. Like all of you, I'm a sinner saved by grace, uh, and, and because of that, born again. And that's what I pray for anybody who's engaged in that conduct. What I'm talking about are the, the illegal attacks. What we're going to talk about are the legal attacks that that group of individuals and their surrogates are unleashing on the rest of the country and what you can do to, to protect yourselves. Because there's a clash of absolutes. Make, make, make no question about that. And it is coming, and, and quite frankly, it's actually upon us. Religious liberty rights, our rights to believe, to speak and act upon those beliefs versus what is now being raised as a new sexual orthodoxy. I got to be in the Supreme Court two weeks ago to hear the arguments in the marriage case. And let me tell you, the other side wants to elevate this right, and, and, and they speak of it as same-sex marriage, but it's so much more than that. It, it, it's really a right to engage in homosexual conduct and to be protected in that. They want to see that right enshrined in our Constitution. And they want to elevate it to a constitutional right. And I'd submit beyond elevating it to a constitutional right, they want to elevate it all the way up to it's an all-important right that trumps all other rights, including religious liberty. So what has happened, I'm sure my, our good friend Dr. Dennison uh, talked about this, but what we've seen in this country is, you know, at our founding, religion was central to who we are as Americans. And so our founders understood that we needed to protect that rule of religion because religion was a check on government. And so it was central, and so the founders put in place mechanisms in the Constitution, protections in the Bill of Rights to protect the centrality of religion. And we've moved, and really, I'm, I'll be 50 this year. I know, that surprises you. You thought I was younger, didn't you? Um, I just act younger is what my wife says. <laughs> um, what we've seen in my lifetime from the 60s until around the 2000s, We've seen religion go from a rule of centrality to where it's become marginal. And I submit to you, we've now seen in our times, central to marginal, to now it's viewed as being detrimental. I mean, look at the Pew study that was released. I mean, open your paper this morning and read about the Pew study. Turn on CNBC. Yeah, actually, sometimes I do turn that on. Or read in the New York Times, talking about the minimizing rule of religion. Now, you've got to really dive into that study because actually all, us, evangelicals, we actually have grown. Of course, you're not hearing that reported by the left-wing media. It's a very small growth. Catholics have, have, have went down, I think, by 10%. But nuns have increased to almost being the second largest group in our, in our country on religion. So you've got evangelicals, number first, number one, our group. Uh, second largest group in the country now are nuns, those who don't identify with any religion. 
And unfortunately, that number is highest in those who are less than 30 years of age, where it's even a majority. So it's very, very troubling. So you hear things like that. But beyond that, and that's sort of the marginalization of religion. But I would submit to you today that there are people who really believe that what we do in our churches is detrimental to society. And where that would have never been talked about, it was such a small part of the population who actually said religion was detrimental to society. And what we do on Sundays and what we do on Wednesdays and what we do every day of the week and living out our faith, that that somehow hurts society. Uh, but in fact, uh, there are now, it's a larger growing that our religion is detrimental and therefore it needs to be cabined into a area, but it cannot be out in society. And again, that used to be a small group of people who are arguing it, but we're seeing more and more in you know, places like Indiana where you saw the attack on the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. But it's not just Indiana, it's across the country where people are arguing giving people religious liberty rights is detrimental. The phrase they use, license to discriminate. You know, I, I submit to you that there are those who think that everybody in this room is, is a discriminator because you actually believe in something and you, and you want act upon those beliefs. Therefore, you have a license to discriminate. So my question for you today is, what are you going to do about it? If this clash is coming, or as I really believe has come, what are you going to do today, individually, as a pastor and leader in your church, and then for your church, what are you going to do today to do it? So what we're going to do, I'm going to kind of do an introduction. So I want to talk to a little bit about Liberty Institute. I want to talk a little bit about some of the battles that we're seeing going on out there. Then, then we're going to kind of start to take the, the focus in, and, we're, and we will talk specifically about some of the battles regarding the issue of homosexuality and where it is intersecting with churches and ministries and other faith-based organizations. And then after the, after the break, which will be about 11 if I stay on time, um, then we're going to go into really some nuts and bolts, some practicalities. What should your church be doing today when that attack comes? And if you're sitting there thinking, well, why am I here? I mean, I know where, I, I know where our church believes on this issue. We're, we're there. We're, we, we believe in, 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 in the biblical instruction. You know, why am I there? Well, you're here because you're going to be confronted with, I, I suspect because we're seeing this in other churches, Texas is no longer immune. We used to think we're in Texas, we don't have these issues. Well, when that Supreme Court rules at the end of June and, and same-sex marriage becomes a constitutional right, trust me, it's coming to your church. It's coming to your church if you go outside the four walls of your church. Now, if you just stay in your church and, and you don't let anybody else in and it's just you, and, and, and uh, can I say frozen chosen, which isn't Baptist, that's, that's what we call Presbyterians, right? Um, but it's just you and your group and you don't want to grow and you just want to keep your 50 people or so together and not grow and just stay in and have a great time together, then you probably can leave right now. But if you're actually engaged in your community and you're going outside the four walls of your church, then you need to know how to protect yourself. If you open up your church facility at all to outsiders coming in, then you're going to need to know these things. And that's why I brought the smart person. So Chelsea, Chelsea will break down the nitty gritty. Uh, we've been doing this for, I think, about 70 now ministries that we have been helping to make sure that they're prepared. And so what we've done to kind of give you a quick advance is you're going to have a handout. It's going to have the, some written policies we believe you need to adopt. We, we've also got a great website that, that, that will help you more, more, more later. All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, what, what, what I do at Liberty Institute. And as Morgan said, I, I'm relatively new to, to Liberty Institute. The name that, that you're probably most familiar with, being here in the Dallas area, uh, is Kelly Shackelford. Kelly is my boss. Uh, he's the general, uh, he's the, he's the uh, chief counsel, president, and CEO of Liberty Institute. And five years ago, I thought I wanted to be a judge. Kelly and God had a different vision. Uh, and I was working with him and seeking a judicial appointment. The end result was Kelly offered a job that I never knew existed. Uh, didn't know it was my dream job, but that's how God works, right? Uh, and I will tell you, it's been, the, it's been the greatest five years of my professional life. Uh, I get to do every day what God has called you to do, and I know you all feel that as you're engaged in your various ministries. 
So I came to, to Liberty Institute with 19 years, almost 20 years of corporate litigation experience. I've been representing big corporations, helping them save money, I guess. But uh, no, in, you know, in, in real corporate lawsuits, and God was training me. God was training, training me for today. So I've taken that corporate litigation experience and now we've taken that. And we've taken Liberty Institute that at the time that I joined, Liberty Institute was primarily a Texas group engaged in Texas, on Texas litigation issues. Where today, five years later, we're the largest legal organization in America that's dedicated solely to defending and restoring religious liberty in America. And so we've done that. We've, last year we worked on over 200 uh, cases in about 22 states where people's rights were, 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 were violated. I think this morning I've got lawyers in California working. We've got lawyers in Austin working. Uh, I think apparently, I think, we've, I think right now, uh, currently we've got, we're in 20 states and about 100 legal matters that, that are going on um, today. Our vision at Liberty Institute is to restore religious liberty pursuant to the principles of the Founding Fathers. We believe the Founding Fathers understood it. Uh, they understood the importance of, of religious liberty as a foundational freedom. That, you know, and, and what's great about being a Baptist is, I mean, the Baptist tradition, we were right there in, in the beginning, in the founding, arguing for the importance of religious liberty because our ancestors of, of our faith understood that we wanted to have free churches because free churches made free people and, and made a free government. And so the founders understood that religious freedom it would become the first freedom. And so it is the first phrase of the first clause of the Bill of Rights. So the first phrase of the First Amendment is the protection that, that gives us uh, religious liberty. No establishment. We don't want a national church. No establishment of religion but protecting the free exercise of religion. And that word's important. The founders didn't just kind of stumble on the word free exercise. They, they actually, that meant something to them. And, I, and I'd submit to you, we've lost that meaning. Oh, lots of us have lost that meaning today. The founders understood that all freedoms, political freedom, economic freedom, flows from religious liberty. And so our, our mission at, at, at Liberty Institute is to defend and restore religious liberty we do so in four main areas, in our schools, for our churches, inside the military, and throughout the public arena. The military is new, and, and I don't want to get, go down too many rabbit trails, but that, that's the latest attack, because you've got a hierarchical system where people who do not believe in religious freedom are now running the show, from, from, from the, the chief executive officer on down. And what we've seen is attack and after attack on our service members, even chaplains. Our latest one is we represent a chaplain uh, in the US Navy who was counseling on the issues that we're talking about today. He was literally, he had sailors coming in asking about advice concerning the issue of homosexuality. And he gave, he, he's ordained by a, a different uh, evangelical denomination, Assemblies of God, but believe like we do on the issue that the, that the Bible prohibits homosexual conduct. And Chaplain Motter expressed that to, to these sailors. And they complained. He gave biblical counseling pursuant to the teachings of his church. They complained. And so what, the, what did the Navy officials do? They relieved him of, of his duties. They're now trying to kick him out of the Navy because he crossed a line in their view. Because in today's Navy, you, you can't take a view on, on, on that issue. Uh, and, that's, and we shouldn't be surprised, we had another sergeant in the Air Force who was relieved of his duties because his lesbian commander wanted him to affirm her view concerning marriage, which he couldn't do because of his faith. Uh, and so he was, they tried to court-martial him, kick him out, we went in and, and saved him. But just another area, and he, it just shows you, because the military's interesting, again, because they can control it, it shows you what the left and what those who are anti-religionist want to do to our country. They, they want to remove, they want to remove re, religion from uh, our, 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 our public life. 
what's a little bit, you might say, well, I've heard of groups like, like yours before. I mean, they're, you know, we all know some of the other groups, and you probably, again, you probably recognize Kelly. What's a little bit different that we do at Liberty Institute when we actually get involved in litigation. So we're not doing sort of preventive work like, like we are today, but we actually have a case uh, where, where, where you know, someone has sued or been sued. What we do is we actually employ, uh, uh, and they volunteer, some of the top lawyers in the country at the top law firms. Because what's really neat, what God has done, God has strategically placed these great attorneys in the top law firms throughout the United States. And so there, there are, and, and I know that because I, I at one point was one of them in one of those firms, and is what I came from, where there are believers who God has placed in these firms who every day are working on these cases. And then um, they're just looking to give back to the Lord. And I'm sure some of these guys may be in your churches. And that's what, the reason I mention it is, we're always looking for good volunteer attorneys because we couldn't do 110 cases in 22 states with 10 staff attorneys at Liberty Institute. We need good volunteer attorneys. But we've gotten to work with the, 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 the gentleman there um, to my right is Paul Clement, who's the former Solicitor General of the United States. He argued the first marriage case at the Supreme Court. He's also argued more cases at the U.S. Supreme Court than any person alive today. He's one of our volunteer attorneys. Senator Cruz, before he was Senator Cruz, he was Ted Cruz to us, he was one of our volunteer attorneys and actually helped defend a veterans memorial uh, successfully in the, uh, that, that, that we were able to prevail on. And then the, the, the next gentleman was a guy named Jim Ho who took Ted's place as Solicitor General of Texas. Jim's now at one of the largest law firms in the world and, and he's helping us. But we now work with 25 of the top 50 law firms where God has placed these people who volunteer their time for free to work on our cases defending religious liberty. They are the best lawyers, and it's why, and this is a remarkable stat, we win over 90% of our cases. You know, most groups it's 50-50, but we don't believe in fighting windmills. We, we, we believe that if it's good enough for Ford Motor Company to hire the best attorneys, that when a church or ministry is sued, that they get the best attorneys possible. And what I'm convinced is God has now placed these guys strategically, and we can get that. So we have a case in Montana, then we're gonna find great local counsel in Montana, a believer who understands the local situation but also is committed to, to, to the ministry that, that, that he's defending. So how do we find, you know, where, 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 where's America today? And, and again, because you're engaged, you probably appreciate this, although I will submit to you, as bad as you think it is, it's worse. Trust me, as bad as you think it is, it's worse. And I've just seen it in the last five years. I mean, when I joined Liberty five years ago, I mean, we were battling on fronts, but we weren't seeing a lot of attacks on churches themselves. We certainly weren't seeing the, church, the, the attacks on the military. Well, Katie, bar the door. There is nothing that sank, that, that, that's sacred anymore. There's nothing that's untouchable anymore. Uh, Things that we never thought would be occurring are, are now occurring. And I'd submit to you, they're, they're in our courts right now. Because just in, in, in our experience at Liberty Institute, but the other groups that are defending religious liberty, we're at, hostility is at an all-time high in, in the history of our nation. The current administration is the most hostile, but doesn't stop with the current administration. It's throughout. And these groups on the left, they have war chests of money upon money in which they are funding lawsuits against lawsuit, that any time people of faith engage in public, someone is going to be there to counter them, either through public relations or even through lawsuits. I mean, I just know it, even in Texas, I look at Texas, how many school districts, they do anything, boom, they're getting, getting a demand letter from an outside group. Local town, put up a nativity scene, bam, they're getting a letter from one of these groups. And, and, and these you know, people, and I'm sure you've got people in your churches who are serving on city councils, who are serving on school boards. You need, you need to come in and support those folks. And you need to tell them, don't cave in. Because more times than not, those letters that they get from the outside groups are at best misleading, if not downright false. 
And so we, I don't know how many times I get, you know, the good superintendents call us and say, Jeff, I got this letter from this, some group in Wisconsin, Freedom From Religion Foundation. They're telling me um, we can't have youth ministers on, on our campus anymore. Is that right? No, that's not right. That, that, that they're, that they're, they're telling me I can't have an assembly in which I bring in a pastor who's not there to evangelize, but there's to share some character. Is that right? No, that's not right. So I encourage your members when they see this, that, 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 that they won, reach out to us or someone like us and get the real story. And unfortunately, they're school board lawyers. They're just looking for risk adverse. And, and so there are more times than not, the school board lawyer or the city attorney is just going to tell them, stop that. Oh, you pray before your meetings? Oh, stop that. Well, what about the Supreme Court decision last year that says you can pray before your meetings? They, they sometimes forget to mention that. Um, what about the principle in, enshrined in the Constitution of neutrality? When you exclude religion, you're actually being anti-religion, and the First Amendment does not allow that. So it, very, I, I'd encourage you. The other thing, um, since I've got a, a room full of, of pastors, when one of your members is actually out there and they're engaged in one of these battles, please support them. Because I, you know, one of, it's the time of year where, where one of the areas we work in are schools, right? And so you're going to have a young man or a young woman who's a valedictorian. And even again, in Texas, we have school districts telling the valedictorians, well, you can't mention God during your valedictory address. That might offend someone. Well, not mentioning God offends me. So especially if that's their, that's their belief. Yes, go ahead. Well, that, that's perfect. I mean, the, the big dirty word is Jesus, right? Uh, but sometimes it's, it's as, in some places, it's even been God. Other times it's been Jesus. But I, I'll give you an example. We represented a young man uh, who wanted to give his valedictory address and actually turned off the mic during his valedictory address. And that was completely wrong, completely unconstitutional when we, when we came in and, and showed the school district what they had done. You know, he went to a church where his pastor brought him in with his family and said, I don't think you should, be in get, you should be doing this. You shouldn't have called the Liberty Institute. And they had to leave that church. Now, the, it did, the superintendent went to the church. Um, some of the school board members went to the church, but there was this idea that he couldn't assert his religious liberty right. I just think, I mean, right is right. And so I'd encourage you when, 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 when you have that. A few years ago, we sensed these attacks were on the rise. Uh, and so we, we, we've been talking about it. Kelly and I and others on our team had been out talking about it. And, and, and so we kind of got challenged. Well, you're just giving sort of examples, but really, is it, is it really, I mean, is this any different than it was in the 60s? Is this any different? Um, that, is it really increased? And so in 2012, we actually, decided as, as a team, and then I think we only had five staff attorneys, but I took one of our staff attorneys and, and told him, I want you to start collecting, using some of our interns, start collecting the examples, all the situations where folks' religious liberty rights are, are being threatened, where, where there's hostility to, to, to religion. So in 2012, we, we released our first survey, and, and we gathered 600 instances of where folks' religious liberty rights were threatened. And what we did, because we knew we'd be attacked, we made sure that every one of them could be sourced to either a court case or to a, a, a article uh, in the newspaper, to a media source. So every one of them is footnoted and you know exactly where they are. So we did that in 2012. Well, last year we, we completed our third edition. And so we have gone, and this is the third edition, uh, and we've gone from 600 two years ago to 1,400 this past year. And I'll submit to you, 2015 is going to be even more. So that's 133%. And we've got, for each of you today when you leave, I've got a, a copy of this. Because I think it's so important that you get a feel for the type of attacks that are, that, that, that are occurring. And, and one thing that you'll notice when you thumb through this and you see all the different different ones, and basically we have every one with, with a paragraph and then a source for it. But th there are examples like you know, s some of our cases. 
a young man in Florida who had received a Bible for, for Christmas. He got a new NIV, and, and he came from really a, a non-religious family, or actually a, ca a Catholic family. But someone had given him God's word. He got really excited about reading God's word. His name, I love saying his name. His name is Giovanni Rubio. So Giovanni. A young Giovanni, a fifth grader, gets it. And, and, you could, and it's great because you get to see his, his Bible. And uh, he, uh, um, he uh, um, it's, it's torn. And it's, it, it's something, the kid has read it. I mean, it's, it's pretty neat. And um, Giovanni put it in his backpack. And every chance he got, he would read God's word. I mean, it's just, it's what we all know about God's word. It's what you want to see your fifth grader doing, right? Getting excited about God and, 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 and his word. And so during free reading time at this public school in Florida, they said, all right, everybody, you know, get out your book. And so kids got out Harry Potter and kids got out the Hunger Games and Giovanni got out the book of John. Uh, and his teacher tells him, you can't read that, that, that you, you can't read that, you're not allowed. Uh, now, that's me saying, you're saying, well, he's a fifth grader, maybe he, you know, missed it. No, she calls his father and leaves a voicemail, and I could play for you that voicemail where this teacher says, we're not going to allow those type of books in my classroom. Now, that violates the First Amendment. That's, that's hostility to religion, which is, a host, which is the First Amendment. But that's one of the, that's one of 1,400 examples that, 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 that's, that's in this book. At no time in our nation's history have religious ministries, churches, and its pastors and faith-based organizations been under attack than more so than today. And unfortunately, the people on the other side are powerful and, and they're well-funded. And their objective, but it's not minced words, it's to purge religion from public life. That's what they want. Um, there are those who are fully committed to remove any mention of God and religion from our public life. And I, I want to name them because I want you to be familiar with who they are. Some of them you know, some of them you, you, you may not know. It starts with the American Civil Liberty Union, the ACLU. Their budget is over $120 million. Um, it's groups like Americans United for Separation of Church and State. You guys have all heard that phrase, right? Separation of Church and State. When I speak to, to kids, what I often do is I'll have a $100 bill, or I used to have a $100 bill before I became a nonprofit lawyer. I guess now I would have maybe a 20, and I'm not even sure I have that today. But I would hold it up and I would ask the kids, first person who can show me the word separation of church and state in the US Constitution gets this $100 bill. Now that's a great bet for me, right? Because I don't bet, I'm Baptist, right? No betting, no gambling. Um, 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 because it's not in there. Actually, that phrase, of course, Baptist, we can take credit for that phrase because it was a letter from Thomas Jefferson after the First Amendment had been enacted to Danbury Baptist in Connecticut. And what Jefferson was talking about there was not keeping religion from influencing government. It was actually the opposite. It was keeping the government out of our churches. And that's what the Danbury Baptist had raised in the letter because to read Jefferson's letter, you actually need to read the letter that the Danbury Baptist had written him. And their concern was government coming in and fooling around with uh, our, our, our churches. Uh, but the founders, again, that phrase is free exercise. And this is important because this will be the basis when we get into the issues of how do we protect your church. What we're going to center you in on are these constitutional pr protections. It's so protections that have been given to us that exist today in federal law and state law. And it's important for you to understand that the phrase in the Constitution is free exercise of religion. The government shall not prohibit free exercise of religion. Okay? That's the, the language is prohibit free exercise. And that's important because the other side will use a different phrase. And it's not in the Constitution. And it's freedom of worship. Our Constitution is not limited to protecting freedom of worship. Our founders specifically rejected that notion because free exercise is more than freedom of worship. So when President Obama or Secretary Clinton talk about freedom of worship, and you saw, we saw this change eight years ago, and, and, and they're just parroting things that people at Harvard are talking about 
or other Ivy League schools. They're, they're trying to take our religion and box us in. Because they want us, when they talk about freedom of worship, they're talking about what we do in this room on Sunday morning or in this facility on Wednesday night. They're not talking about taking a group of men to van to, 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 to minister. They're not talking about when you go out and, and, and you do street evangelism. They're, they're not talking about when you go out and feed the hungry. They're not talking about when you seek to expand your church. They're only talking about what you do in the four walls of that. That's freedom of worship. Our founders rejected that notion because they understood it wasn't just what we believe or what we do on Sunday mornings. It's, it's the ability to actually speak and it's the ability, ability to act upon those beliefs. And that's vitally, vitally important. And that, I think when you hear that language and you hear freedom of worship, I mean, it kind of sounds right. Freedom of worship, well, let me tell you, the Soviet Union and its constitution protected freedom of worship. How did that work out for them? This isn't about freedom of worship. It's about free exercise. It's about believing what we believe. It's about speaking those beliefs and then acting on those beliefs. That's what free exercise protects. And that's important because when they come to you and tell you you can't have certain views and you can't act on those views, you're, you're going to say, no, 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 that's not, that's not what my constitution protects. And the good is we've got good precedent that actually will protect you. And we'll, 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 we'll talk some, some about that. All right. Now, you're saying, oh, you're exaggerating. You know, you're a lawyer and lawyers are prone to exaggerate. Um, and that, that may be, that may be dif difficult to say, but this clash is coming and, and, it, and the idea of boxing us in, it's not me. How about the New York Times? This is a guy named Frank Bruni, um, who's actually a homosexual. Uh, and at the beginning of this year, Mr. Bruni wrote uh, an op-ed in the New York Times. Uh, and I kind of, everybody know, Cal Thomas, you guys, everybody know who Cal Thomas is, the commentator? Cal Thomas says, he, he reads, he reads, his, his, the New York Times every day to figure out what Satan's doing, and then he reads the Bible to figure out what God's doing. And I've kind of taken that approach to things, so I often do read the New York Times. But what Frank Bruni said is, and I support the right of people to believe what they do and say what they wish. Well, that's good, right? In their pews, homes, and hearts. But outside of those places, do you get that? So again, that's freedom of worship. I mean, what we believe in our pews, our homes, and our hearts, what's missing there? I mean, we've, I've even seen now people complaining about legislators and city council. Keep your religion. You need to keep your religion at home and in your church. Don't bring that religion here to, to our public meetings. That's not, I mean, the founders just would have went, uh, that's not the America that they designed at all. Um, now, okay, so you say, well, that's the New York Times. What do we expect? It's the New York Times. I mean, leading liberal newspaper in, in the country. Although I submit to you, when the New York Times speaks, it's speaking for the left uh, and, and, and liberals across the line. The EEOC. You know, the EEOC, the largest organization in the country, a federal agency that deals with employment matters. And so, you know, when an employee, you have to bring a claim if you've been discharged. And so this is the commissioner, names. Kai Feldblum, I was with her uh, a, a year ago uh, uh, for, for, for some meetings where she was asked to take this back and, and she wouldn't. So this is the number one employment lawyer for the federal government. And what she said, when religious liberty and sexual liberty conflict, I'm having a hard time coming up with any case in which religious liberty should win. And, and you know, at the time, you know, we're saying, well, the First Amendment is part of the Constitution and this new sexual orthodoxy. And, and that sexual liberty is, is code for homosexuality, transgenderism, bisexuality, it's LGBTQ. Chelsea, do you know the rest? There's 51. Say it again. There's 51 gender. Oh, 50, well, no wonder I, it's longer than the alphabet. 51 different, and you just see, I mean, I, we were looking at something on Facebook now. There's a uh, male, female, other. So this is, this is other wins over religious liberty. Uh, and again, top lawyer for 
the Obama administration dealing with employment. Well, it gets even that argument that I was at two weeks ago. You know, the case deals with, it, does the 14th Amendment require that all states redefine marriage to include same-sex couples? And I submit to you that the real issue is does the 14th Amendment require a redefinition that would destroy marriage? Because marriage is between, I mean, the definition of marriage is one man and one woman. It's been that for millennia. And what they're saying is we want to completely destroy that and they're arguing now for two men to be able to get married or two women to get married. I submit to you that there'll be no line there. And actually, in, 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 in the arguments, um, Chief Justice Roberts, who's in the center there, said, I mean, what's, what is the limiting? I mean, why couldn't four people want to get married? And why not one man and three women or three women and one man? And, and we're going to spare you some of those slides. We actually have a presentation that we get into it. And I will tell you, it, I mean, we say it's PG-13, it may be R, or what do they call the next one, NC-17 or whatever. Um, I mean, it's disgusting. Words, I've learned words I didn't know. Like, I mean, other than Chelsea and, and Joey Lee, my assistants here, have you even heard of the word thropple? Thropple? So that's, that's, that's three people coming together of different sexes, maybe mixed sexes or whatever, they're coming together. Um, there are people who are marrying themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, the people marrying, somebody wanted to marry a tree, um, people marrying their pets. I mean, it's just like, I mean, and, you know, you read the New Testament, you read about all the things, you think, well, that's not going on in, in, in our community. Oh, yes, it is. I mean, it, it, we're back to that. We're back to that time where debauchery rules. Uh, and, that's, and that's really when what was presented at the Supreme Court was the dest complete destruction of marriage and elevating this right to really anything goes. I mean, that's the right they're seeking. Anything goes being elevated into our Constitution. Uh, and in during that, three of the justices raised serious questions about religious liberty. Because raising that issue when you've got, just like Frank Bruni and, and Shai Feldman asked, religious liberty versus sexual the so-called sexual, Al Mohler calls it erotic liberty. Who wins? And three of the justices asked that same question. Who wins? Justice Scalia said, who wins? Are pastors gonna have to be, have to perform same-sex marriages? Now everybody sits there and says, that could never happen. Well, I mean, I would have said five years ago it would never happen that the Supreme Court would even have this case in front of it because we, 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 we had only two states that recognized gay marriage and they did it through the democratic process, one through a court, one through Democrat. And so you never thought it would come here, but that we'd be presented with where come June 30th, the Supreme Court may be imposing same-sex marriage on Texas. I never would have thought that to happen. So, so I think Justice Scalia's question was a good one. Okay, if we rule and we enshrine this into the Constitution, does this mean Pastors are going to have to marry same-sex folks. Um, now, I don't think it does. I think we'll have an argument that will protect you, but it's an argument. It, it's no longer for, for certain. Now, the good is, in Texas, the legislature actually today is, is voting on, in the House of Representatives, it's already passed the Senate, a specific bill that we've worked on uh, with others, with the Attorney General and others, that would protect and give a statutory protection that pastors wouldn't have to violate their consciences. But who would have thought we'd ever have to have that? But that's where we are. And again, you have a Supreme Court justice asking that question. Another question that in the middle, Chief Justice Roberts asked whether religiously affiliated colleges and universities would be required to provide same-sex married housing. So if you have a Christian college um, my son goes to Baylor, so I can, we'll still say, we'll say that Baylor's still a Baptist university. Um, but does, I know, I know, I know, I know, right. Yeah, we could use another, uh, Hardin Simmons, maybe they're more Baptist. Um, um, but would a Baptist university have to have, if it has married housing, would it have to allow same-sexed, marriaged 
students there. Now again, my knee-jerk reaction was, well, of course not. I don't think you can knee-jerk anymore. To the extent you have a Supreme Court justice asking that question. And then finally, Justice Alito asked, the, asked I think, the most chilling one, and perhaps the most alarming one. He asked, okay, if marriage is, is redefined, does that mean, and he said religious schools, but I'd submit to you, you could, you could cross out schools and say organizations. If you don't accept the definition of marriage, this redefined marriage, every, everything goes. Is your tax exempt status in jeopardy? Because this is the government and, and is it in jeopardy? Now, again, my knee jerk is, well, I mean, of course not. I mean, I mean church? They're going to lose their tax exempt because they don't believe what the government thinks it should on an issue that, that, that pursuant their biblical beliefs, beliefs? But that's not the argument when Justice Alito asked that question to the Solicitor General of the United States. Now, to just that. Solicitor General of the United States is the top lawyer for the administration, for the federal government at the Supreme Court. So there's the Attorney General and the Solicitor General. Solicitor General is who's, when he speaks, he's speaking for our federal government. And in response to Justice Alito's question about our tax exempt status for religious schools, if they don't adopt this expanded definition of marriage, assuming the court rules against and, and, and extends marriage to same sex, are they, are, is their nonprofit status in jeopardy? And what the Solicitor General of the United States said, and I'm quoting, it's certainly going to be an issue. I don't deny that. I don't deny that, Justice Alito. It's going to be an issue. Now, there's no difference between a religious school and a, another ministry. So when the Solicitor General of the United States, I think, has sort of shown to us sort of what the ultimate game plan is, which is if you don't get on board with same-sex marriage and rights of homosexuality, what the federal government believes you should believe, then all your rights, you know, your tax-exempt status, the right to participate in any government programs, all that is going, certainly going to be an issue. So in, in the view of the attorney who speaks for the Obama administration, the, the, with the judicial imposition of a redefinition of marriage, what could come is a loss of nonprofit status. And we better be ready. You know, and we're going to have to choose. And so Christian colleges are going to have to choose. Uh, I think ministries are going to have to choose. People of faith are going to have to choose. And, and to me, that's probably the most alarming thing, you know, hearing, being there at the court for those arguments, hearing those arguments, that's probably the most alarming thing. And I, but I wanted to kind of give you a flavor very, very quickly, a flavor for, well, where have we been seeing this? I mean, really, is this an issue? Well, what about adoption and foster care? If, 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 if you know, we represent, a large group represent a group called Christian Alliance for Orphans, which, which is an oversight group for Christian adoption and foster care agencies across the country. And they're saying if you receive any governmental support, then they're saying in their contracts, well, you can't discriminate. And that means if you're a Baptist ministry and you want to place children, you've got to say we won't discriminate on the basis of sex. Well, sex today doesn't mean anymore male-female. Sex means homosexuality, sex means transgender, it means bisexual, and a lot of our clients say, we can't do that. As, as a Baptist ministry, we couldn't place a child into a home with people who are living contrary to scripture. And so what we've seen is, at least in three states, Catholics have the same issue, and actually Catholic Charities has pulled out of Massachusetts, pulled out of Illinois, California, and, and DC, because they can't place children with same-sex couples. Um, we've seen it with ministries serving the homeless and senior citizens. In San Francisco, the Salvation Army has had to pull out because of the city requirement saying, you, you have to violate your beliefs, and again, on, 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 on the issue of, of, of same sex. We've seen it in employment, and 
you know, one of the, one, one of the things, and if we, we have time, we'll, we'll talk about something called the ministerial exception and how churches can be protected um, for its leaders. But there's a case out of Missouri in which a church worker has sued the, the Catholic diocese there for wrongful termination after this church worker announced that she had married a woman. This woman married a woman and they fired her saying that violates Catholic teaching. And the result is a lawsuit. We've seen up in the Northwest in Seattle, a teacher at a Catholic school is suing uh, because he was fired after he was terminated when he announced that he was marrying another man. Uh, and so again, everything, I mean, all the things we thought we didn't have issues, now we're seeing all these issues, even against Christian schools, Catholic schools, the actual Catholic church. In, a, in Colorado, uh, public school has been school, has been sued because a first grader, and I forget the sex, she's a girl who thinks she's a boy or a boy who thinks she's a girl, it's probably that, a boy who thinks she's a girl, and the school said, well, she's not using the girl's restroom. And so she is now sued to have a right to go in. Now, submit to you, a, a parent of three children um, who are no, now young adults, but still, a first grader really knows what their sexual identity, I mean, it just, it's just, I mean, it just shows you how Satan's plan is working and the destruction that's going on. Um, another one, and this one is, dishearten is really disheartening because it's a Christian college in, in California called Azusa Pacific. And they had a professor, and again, I'm going to get it wrong. I think she was a woman, and she was teaching, I believe, all things theology. Uh, and she went away for the summer and came back a man. And Azusa Pacific, you know, they, they didn't, I mean, she's teaching their students. And, that's, and then they looked at their documents, which Chelsea's going to talk about. Well, they really didn't have anything that said that was wrong. And so Azusa Pacific has, had to end up settling this claim by this professor who they wanted in order to get rid of her or him. Um, they, they had to pay money to, 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 to cause him, her, to, to, to go away. Again, because their documents didn't, I mean, they talked about believing in the Bible and believing, but they didn't have anything that was addressing transgenderism or bisexuality and things like that, things you never think you'd have to address, but now you have to address. Um, a California Baptist University had a man fill out an application that he checked that he was a woman because he was in the process of becoming a woman. Then he got to campus and it was obvious he's not a woman. And they said at California Baptist, well, we don't want you here because you misrepresented yourself on your application because you were born a man. And so they expel him, they're rewarded with a lawsuit. In um, New Mexico, same-sex couple sued a Christian preschool because, because they rejected their son, these women's son. And I was mentioning during the break, what we're hearing, and Chelsea's been dealing with some of these too, I think there's a concentrated effort now, especially even in North Texas, we're getting more and more calls where ministries are getting inquiries saying, I'm a lesbian couple, would you allow my child to come there for your Mother's Day Out program? Or um, in, in one of our clients, uh, we see you guys have a mission trip. Are you gay friendly? Would you let two men come on your mission trip if you allow non-members to come on your mission trip? Uh, we're seeing more and more of that. Schools, would you take a student of, you know, a same-sex couple? Would you take a student who says that they're, you know, homosexual? Um, almost like maybe they're setups especially here, you know, it just seems like it's more and more unless every homosexual in the country is moving to North Texas, which maybe is a possibility, I don't know. Um, and then in, you, you may have caught this again in San Francisco, uh, the archbishop there has been very, the archbishop is radical. It's a Catholic who believes in the Bible. I actually got to meet him when I was at that conference. He believes in the Bible and he actually wants Catholics to actually follow Catholic teaching. That's a radical concept, right? They actually want to follow what the church teaches, what the Bible teaches. And he's getting lots of heat because of that. Because that's not, I guess, what Catholics have been doing for a long time. But now he actually has somebody actually calling them. And so he wants the Catholic schools to actually follow Catholic doctrine. And the legislature has opened up a probe. It's 
Does the state need to go in? But again, I get all this religion conflicting with. And you probably, say, you probably saw this one too in uh, upstate New York, a farm who hosted weddings. And these, these folks were, were fined for, because they wouldn't allow a same-sex couple get married on their farm, uh, saying that that violated their, their rights. In Iowa, you had actually ministers um, who, who were being told they're going to go to jail or face a fine uh, if they refuse to perform same-sex weddings. So maybe that legislation that we're working on in Texas is needed, right? Maybe clergies do, do, do need that. And, you know, right here in our own state, the thing, is Texas immune? Well, in, in Texas, with the lesbian mayor of Houston, she's actually subpoenaed the sermons of pastors because the pastors has spoken out against a, sex, a law protecting homosexual uh, conduct and, and homosexuality in you know, accommodations and housing, et cetera, that these pastors have been involved in, among lots of different citizens, but they've been involved in seeking a repeal of that ordinance. And they're rewarded with the mayor subpoenaing their pastors, something that we don't think it ever happened in 235 years of American history. I mean, that's why we, one of the reasons we left England was you had a church and a government together who was messing with religious freedom and, 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 and religious rights. So when that can happen in Houston, Texas, it can happen anywhere. And if it can happen in Houston, it can happen in Louisville, it can happen in Denton, it can happen anywhere. And so the question is, and, and what, what we want to spend our time, the remainder of our time addressing is, okay, Hopefully I've done a good enough job to at least convince you that this is coming. And again, it's not if, it's when. I mean, it's not if your church or ministry is going to be attacked and these issues aren't going to come up. I submit to you, if you have a ministry that is actively engaged in your community, you're going to see this issue. And it's going to come because there are going to be state laws or city laws or national laws. That, that, that impact you. And so our solution is a word, I don't know who we're giving credit for creating it, but I think several people on our staff take credit for it. Um, but the word is religify. Uh, and I had somebody ask me, he said, did George Bush come up with that? Because apparently <laughs> President Bush you know, comes up with the you know, made up words. And, and, and it would be great if he had. Uh, and, and if he'd endorse us and help us, then, then I probably would say he created it. But religify. And what, what it means, or our meaning for the word religify is specify your beliefs and act in accordance with those beliefs. So religify, specify, write them down. Okay. If it's important enough to you, if it's something that you'd kick somebody out on, or you wouldn't hire them on, or you wouldn't allow them to be a member of your church, then it better be written down. And if you wouldn't hire a transgender associate pastor or music leader, then it better be written down somewhere. And just as important, write it down, and then you better be actually living it. <coughs> And so if you believe that marriage is between one man and one woman, then you better be following your, your policies and acting in a way that supports that. And let me tell you, that is more than, I know we're here to talk about homosexuality. There is more to this issue than homosexuality, right? I mean, part of the problem is, while we've seen the destruction of marriage is, and I can, because we're together, right? I'm one of you, you right? Do I need to get my baptism? Well, I can give you my baptismal certificate, right? Um, uh, or my membership. How do we transfer membership? Ever do when we transfer membership? Right. Letter. I could get my letter from First Baptist Garland where I was baptized. I'm one of you, so I'm speaking to myself too. Where we have failed as a church is we're real good today in speaking out against homosexuality. I would submit most of you in this room, you understand that that violates God's law. But where we failed is we failed when divorce became no fault. Where was the church on divorce? We failed on the issue of adultery. 
I mean, how many church, I mean, I, and I, you know, I, I, I'm going to preach to myself, but I just know my own, I just know, you know, again, as a about to be 50 year old man who's been married, okay, Chelsea, don't tell Deanne this, 28 years in June. How many of my friends have gone through devastating divorces for lots of different reasons where the church, best I could tell, was not, was not there? And again, I'm not condemning, the, just like I'm not condemning the homosexual, I'm not condemning the person who's gone through that. But what I am condemning is where was the church? Where was the church in speaking to those issues and speaking and, and working out? So when we talk about this religified, it can't just be about homosexuality. It's got to be about what God's conduct that he's called us to live as believers. And we've got to write that down, and then we've got to act on, 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 on those. Because what we are seeing is, and now that we've been doing this, and we kind of felt, you know, God kind of started with us on staff at Liberty about 18 months ago. So even before some of these issues were starting to rise, we felt like this is something, in addition to all our legal cases, we needed to help <coughs> ministries get, did you kind of get their house in order? And so we started telling them, hey, you need to be looking at your documents. And so as we started and we realized, most of the documents, we just don't have good documents. Which as a, as a corporate lawyer, I mean, that's you always look at. How are your documents for the corporate? And so I started looking at these ministries that I was involved in. And one of them being a Christian school that I ended up being president of at school board. I started looking at these documents and realized, oh my gosh, we, have, we haven't spoken about any of these issues. Uh, and so we started getting the house in order. And so it's like, you know, other ministries need to do this because most faith-based, and we're the one, I mean, Baptists, we may be the worst. Because, you know, what do we say? I mean, look, it's the Bible and Jesus, right? You know, when the kids go up for the children's sermon, you know the answer's going to be Jesus, right? And the kids all shout Jesus. Well, you know, and that is true. It is all about Jesus. <laughs> and it is all about the Bible. I mean, I, I believe that. We've got to write down what we believe. We've got to write down what we believe. And some recent Supreme Court precedents make, 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 that, make that very, very clear. In the Hobby Lobby case, for instance, the reason Hobby Lobby dealt with the Hobby Lobby family, uh, the Green family, and the family called the Han family from Conestoga, can the government require them to provide insurance coverage for abortion and and they said, in the federal law, this thing called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, they said uh, that that violates our religious beliefs. Now, the government argued in that case, when you engage in business, you go outside the four walls of your church, you lose your religious liberty rights. Okay? That's what the government argued. That same Solicitor General who answered Alito's question, that's what he said. That's the price of doing business. Okay? The Supreme Court rejected that argument 504. And the reason they were able to reject that argument was when they looked at the documents of Hobby Lobby and they looked at the documents of Conestoga Wood, they saw that they had affirmed pro-life. They, they had a biblical view. They showed that they were businessmen who were operating pursuant to Christian principles. And the key in the case was, and the court described an honest conviction. They demonstrated an honest conviction of their beliefs. What we have to do as ministries and I submit to you, some of you have worse documents than these for-profit businesses have on these issues. And you need to have your documents in order. And then when you get your documents in order, you better act, yes, act on them, follow them, not just with homosexuality, with everything.